Well, good morning to you. Glad to get a chance to be able to visit with you for a little while this morning. Let me tell you a little bit of my story and I'll let you adjust to my voice because when I first meet people, what I hear the most is, that's not what I expected to come out. <laughs> I get that. Welcome to my life from there. I've served in the United States Senate for the last two years. David Perdue, who was just here uh, before, uh, he and I came into the Senate at the same time. And by the way, he's a solid Christian leader uh, and is doing a very good job here in the United States Senate. I come from a little different background, though. I've served 22 years in youth ministry before I came in the United States Congress. Now, that may seem like an odd direction for you, but quite frankly, my preparation of working with juveniles for so many years was actually very good preparation to come to Congress. <laughs> for my wife and I, this is what she calls life's greatest interruption. We never, we never planned to go to Congress. This was a sense of calling for us. And we really felt that God interrupted our life and said, this is what we're asking you to do. And when God called us to do that, we spent about seven months praying and struggling through that to finally come to the point, I'm going to be an old man one day telling my grandchildren about the time I didn't follow God if I don't do this. So I resigned my position, started to run for Congress, obviously elected, and we're trying to take off into this task to be able to do the right thing the right way and to be able to actually engage a nation in those critical things. Now, I had people that initially told me, you're leaving your calling because you're getting involved in government. That's not where God works. And I always smiled at them and said, I'll tell you what you should do. <clears throat> Once you go to the Old Testament, and of the 39 books of the Old Testament, try to find a book that wasn't written to a political leader, by a political leader, or about a political leader. To, about, or by. Now, for those of you that are gonna get bored in my speech, which will probably happen quickly, you can start thinking about that. I think there are 37 of the 39 books of the Old Testament that meet that category. If you look at even the calling of Saul when he became Paul, and when he was struck blind on the, on the road to Damascus, when Ananias complained and said, do you really want me to go see this guy? The Spirit of God said to Ananias, yes, he is my chosen instrument to the Jews, the Gentiles, and the Gentile kings. And the rest of the book of Acts after that point, you'll see Paul over and over again reaching out to all people groups, including government leaders. Does God have a heart for the nation through government? Absolutely he does. He's the creator of government like he's the creator of the family, like he's the creator of work. So we cannot write off what he has not written off. And we should engage in those areas. But we have a bad habit as Americans to make our elected officials into celebrities. Elected officials are not celebrities. They're asked to do a job. And by the way, this is a real job, and it has real work. It's slow, it's tedious, and common sense things take forever. And I've heard over and over again, you know, big ships don't turn quickly. And I always smile and say, yes, but they do turn, but you have to start by turning the wheel. And eventually they will turn. We turned into the storm that we're in as a nation right now because prior Congresses and prior leadership, including some current leadership, have turned us into that storm we can turn our way back out. The challenge is exactly how do we do that and how can we get that done? I would tell you over the past couple of years and what's happened in the Senate and what's happened in the House, it's been pretty remarkable to see. To answer Hillary Clinton's favorite question, what difference does it make? Let me give you a few thoughts uh, just for the Senate on what difference it really does make. We're actually voting again. And I know that may seem like a trivial thing, but you don't move on issues unless you actually start voting again. Two years ago, or three years ago now, under Harry Reid's leadership, there were 14 amendment votes. 14. We're in the hundreds. We're back into voting again and trying to get on the floor to be able to move things. Two years ago, we actually passed the first balanced budget plan that's been passed by the Congress since 2001. We've laid out a path. In fact, David Perdue, who was just here before, he and I and several others are working on a plan to be able to reform the budget process, how we do the budget. Every single year since 1974, we all complain about the same thing. The budget process is not working. Well, maybe at some point we ought to fix the process. So we're trying to lay out how do we actually fix this process and make it work better working on how do we actually get the Senate back to work again. The first significant education reform, getting rid of the Common Core mandates, getting rid of all the different mandates. That happened this past year. That was not just a conversation. We passed that into law. We put on the president's desk a full repeal of Obamacare. We put on the president's desk uh, defunding Planned Parenthood. Shock among shock, he vetoed both of those. But both those items made it all the way to his desk. Major highway bill, 
We uh, actually had a nice piece in the Wall Street Journal today on a, on a piece of work that I have done dealing with freedom of worship and freedom of religion. Uh, there are lots of folks in this administration and other folks around this town that want to equate freedom of religion and freedom of worship. Those are two different things. And in our citizenship up until this year, our citizenship test asked new citizens what is one of the freedoms that we have as a nation, and it listed freedom of worship. I challenged them on it and said that's not what our Constitution says. Freedom of worship means if you're in that specific place, at a specific time, you can worship how you want to. We have the free exercise of religion. That means you can worship any place, any time, and live your faith out, not only in your church house, but anywhere you choose to, because we have the free exercise of religion. The, the immigration folks, The immigration folks initially said, no, they're going to leave the text as it is. We continue to press them on it and just had a letter back from them not long ago saying, you're right, we're going to change this to what our constitutional right is. And the Wall Street Journal has a nice piece about that. Now, those are small victories, but you start adding up small victories and we're turning the ship, trying to ride us out of the storm, and it will be a long way. I would tell you there are a lot of people that have this sense that our hope should be in Washington. I would tell you our hope should not be in Washington. I would tell you we have a higher hope than that. I would also tell you that for all the folks that believe if we just elect the right people, they will change the nation. Let me remind you of something. Washington doesn't change the country. The country changes Washington. So the way that this will turn around is a lot harder. It is the engagement of people like you that will actually engage in the hard work because this is tougher than we want to say it is at times. And quite frankly, there is this sense that if we could only get Washington to flip, it'll flip everything else. And as we come to the reality of it will really flip when we change our neighborhoods, our families, and our communities, and our churches, that's where the work begins, but that's where it actually works in the end. So here's what I'd like to challenge you for, just a few things. I would like to encourage you to do something bold. Vote. Lean in. Get engaged. It's amazing to me the number of Christians that step back and say, you know what, I really doesn't make a difference. It's one vote. It's tiring. It's a long line. I'm mad at this candidate or this candidate, and so I'm just not going to vote. Well, tell you what, that is a sure sign of watching God just be removed from any kind of influence in Washington, D.C. If we, as the church, fail to step up and vote, we abdicate all of that leadership to everyone else who's not in the church. The church has a responsibility to step up and make sure our voices are actually heard. The church has the responsibility to step up and say, our task is our task. I am afraid, and as a person who's been in ministry for two decades, I am concerned that at times the church is saying, you know what, government's gonna take care of that. Government's gonna take care of those in poverty. Government's going to take care of those that have great need. Government's going to take care of all those issues. You know what? We have 4.1 million federal employees now, the highest number of federal employees in the history of the government. Our federal budget is over $4 trillion, the highest budget that it's ever been in the history of the government. How's that working out for us? You know what would be a simple solution? Maybe a simple solution is to say, maybe the church needs to step up and be the church again, and to actually do what we are called to do. <laughs> foundation of the nation, foundation of the nation has always been our families. It's always been there. You see, government rises and gets bigger when families collapse. And as families falter, government rises and tries to help children that are exposed, tries to help moms that are exposed, tries to help in education, in criminal justice. All of those things are based on the collapse of the family. So the government continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger to solve the issue of the family. Government's not a great solution for families. Churches are. If churches were to lean in and say, I'm going to mentor young families so we don't see the divorce rate that we have. We have 400,000 children in the foster care system right now. If every church were to adopt one child or to have one foster family in their church, one foster family, we would solve the foster care issue in our nation. There are very specific ways the church can step up and lead in this, and we are at our best when we actually do that. You see, we don't believe that government is the final solution. We actually believe in crazy verses like Psalm 121, I lift my eyes up towards the mountains. There's a hill higher than Capitol Hill. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. 
We get the bigger picture here. It's not Capitol Hill, it's the pinnacle spot. We understand that there is something bigger, but we also understand there's not only a right thing to do, there's a right way to do it. Family, let me tell you one of the challenges the church has and what we have as Christians. We get drawn into the siren song of the angry voices and we assume that's the way we're gonna make a difference. Peter wrote to a church in a very pagan society and he said to them, I challenge you to be aliens and strangers in this world, to live such good lives among the Gentiles that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good works and glorify God on the day that he visits us. And then he said, here are five ideas of how you can stand out in the crowd. Number one, honor authority. You wanna make a difference in our community? We do politics in a different way. We stand up for what's right and we honor authority at the same time we're doing it. The whole world will look at us and say, why do you do that? And it gives us the opportunity to be able to present truth. We are not consumed with being the angriest. We're consumed with being right and doing God's work, God's way. And at times, I believe, we pray for revival because it sounds so much easier than actually doing the work. You know what we can do? Let's lean in. Let's do the work because there is much to be done in our nation and the church of all people should lead. I have a job. I've been given it by the people of the state of Oklahoma and I will do it with all my might because we have a lot to get done. But we together have much to get done together. Let's do it. God bless y'all.